that, all right? So with that out of the way, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for a second seminar in this new series. Um, and once again, we have quite quite a nice turnout. Um, my name is Zach Shurip Conti, and I'm a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute in London. Although currently, as I've said, um, I'm talking to you from, from Malta. I would also like to introduce my colleagues and co-organizers for the seminar series, Andrea Pizzaferrato, who is an assistant professor at the University of Bath, and Temis Botsas, who is also a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Alan Turing Institute, this is um, UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. So um, also for the benefit of those joining us um, for the first time, uh, I'd like to simply briefly introduce the topic of this bi-monthly series, and that is um, physics enhanced machine learning for engineering applications. Um, physics enhanced machine learning is an upcoming subfield in machine learning and deep learning that aims to integrate known physical understanding of observed phenomenon into the machine learning framework. And the advantages of this include data efficiency and interpretability um, of these prediction models, which are vital criteria for real world engineering applications. Um, on a side note, if any of you are interested to share your work um, within this, this remit, uh, in an, any of our upcoming seminars, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, and finally, as a format of this seminar, our speaker will, will talk to us about maybe for 30 to 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. Um, and the questions may be asked in person by raising the hand function um, in the Zoom chat, which I will remind you how to, uh, which, I, which I will remind you of later on. So without further ado, I'll ask my colleague Temis to introduce um, our speaker for today. And with that, I thank you all um, so much. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, we're really happy because our second speaker uh, in this seminar is going to be Professor Paul Wilcox. Professor uh, Wilcox has a Master's of Engineering in, from the University of Oxford, a PhD, and later on a research associate position in Imperial College. And he's currently a professor of dynamics in the Department of Mechanical Engineering of the University of Bristol. He's also a Turing Fellow here in our Institute and a co-founder of a spin-out company called Inductosense Limited, which is focusing on commercializing ultrasonic sensors. His main interests uh, include uh, ultrasonic partial manipulation, uh, data analysis, signal processing, embedded sensors, among others. And today he's going to talk to us about applying machine learning models to non-destructive evaluation data. Thank you very much, Professor Wilcox, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and uh, morning, uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry, I, I realise I got the title wrong. It should be physics enhanced machine learning, but I should probably stress that I'm a, a, a an NDE person, not a machine learning expert. So I'm coming at this very much from the application side, and I, I'm kind of hoping that some people will be able to tell me what we're doing wrong or right on the machine learning front. So I've been in NDE, which I'll, ex I'll explain a bit more about what that is in a moment for. Uh, quite a long time, probably 25 years now. So I know a lot about the application and I guess everything I've done until the last few years has been very much physics-based analysis of data. But uh, like other communities, we're seeing the potential of machine learning. So that's kind of what I'd like to share with you today. Uh, wrong button. Okay, yeah, right. So non-destructive evaluation or NDE is a definite um, discipline associated specifically with determining the mechanical integrity of uh, either materials or components. So uh, if it didn't have uppercase initials, um, almost any measurement could be described as non-destructive, but NDE with capital letters is very much things that are associated with um, structural integrity. Uh, examples, uh, there's probably half a dozen main methods with any number of subdivisions within them, but the ones that I work with almost exclusively are ultrasonic ones. Another big method is X-ray uh, and X-ray CT. Uh, other methods include anything based on electromagnetic waves, uh, visual techniques, and probably something else that I can't immediately think of. But the ND is one of those things that happens in the background every day, and most of the time you don't hear anything about it, which is good because it means it's doing its job. Um, when something goes wrong, uh, it's generally headline news, uh, So, you know, and big numbers involve potentially loss of life, so shutting down um, Haysham and Hartlepool nuclear power stations uh, uh, about six years ago because a crack was found due to NDE in one of the boiler pods was a pretty expensive cost for the company and a, and a reasonable dent in the UK's generating capacity. 
there was a recent incident uh, a few months ago, a couple of um, fan blades came out of Pratt & Whitney engines in the, uh, one in the US and there were some pictures on the news. Again, it was a, a well, unfortunately in that case, it was a failure of NDE procedure that failed to flag a defect that had been noticed. Um, and yeah, fortunately nobody was injured, but it's still an expensive business. So um, <clears throat> the kind of the context is that um, NDE is becoming like everything else more and more digital and the, there's more and more tools available to collect vast quantities of digital data. Um, it, there's some numbers on the previous slide, but uh, tens or hundreds of megabytes from one measurement. And there's more and more measurements being performed. There's things like permanently installed sensors that can get data every minute if you wanted them to. So there's a huge flow of data um, and historically it's all been analyzed manually. So um, not surprisingly, the NDE community is looking out, uh, and I'd say the NDE community is not necessarily the most forward-thinking one, but it, it's not completely naive about what's going on, and they can see all these things, exciting things happening in other fields, and kind of want a bit of the action. So, um, we, we're just starting to explore a move away from more physics-based interpretation of data, uh, and I'll explain uh, maybe what I mean by that in a, in a while, uh, towards something that's more data-driven, or more likely something that's actually halfway between the two. Uh, so, so, I mean, the, the motivation, um, I guess there's two aspects to this. Um, there's the um, trying to help the humans or better still take them out of the loop as far as possible on the routine data interpretation tasks. Um, obviously, as soon as you have people involved, there's opportunities for um, mistakes, tiredness, etc., cetera, to, to creep in. And as the volume of data goes up and up, we're actually running out of trained operators to, to, to deal with measurements. So benefits here are just increasing the reliability, increasing the capacity and, and reducing the cost. But then of course, there's a more exciting aspect potentially, which is that does the, does the application of machine learning enable something to be done that can't be done at the moment either because uh, it's too many steps to be implemented by a trained operator, the data's got too many dimensions to be easily visualized, or maybe we're looking at combining data from completely dissimilar measurements, whether they're, I don't know, electromagnetic data with ultrasonic data so that trying to figure out how to put them together is not necessarily obvious and this is much about increasing the capability i just realized i'm pointing at things with my mouse but you can't see that can you so i need to put the old laser pointer on and um, the, the challenge is um which i guess are common to quite a lot of uh, field uh, safety critical end but um nd is mostly applied to high value or uh, safety critical plants fortunately genuine defects are pretty rare um, but that also means that getting ground truth data about genuine defects um, is very, very hard. Even if a, a, a defect like say that this crack is found, it, most likely it will be cut out, the component will be repaired and the, the, the bit of metal that contained the defect will be thrown away or it may be destroyed in the process of removal. And even if it is preserved, getting the true nature of a, a, an embedded defect is, is going to be a costly operation. It will require uh, X-ray CT or maybe progressive sectioning, which is a destructive technique. So generally speaking, we have to uh, assume that although we can get data from defect-free components and structures re relatively easily, getting data from uh, components with defects in where you actually know what the defect is, is, is not easy. And we're also operating in a highly regulated environment. Um, anything on a safety critical plant, including NDE, has to be uh, qualified. So there'll be regulators looking at it to uh, convince themselves that the proposed uh, inspection will indeed detect everything that it claims to do. So we have metrics like the probability detection for a certain size of defect. And we're typically operating in the sort of high 90, uh, 90 percentiles uh, in terms of the reliability required. And there's a, there's a, uh, as I say, when, it, when a new inspection is proposed, there'll have to be a, a qualification procedure. And at the moment, the, the, the way that these are written is very much based on physical reasoning. So um, a, a knowledge of the underlying physics, explaining the, 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 the way the test operates, and then maybe with some example experimental results confirming that it works the way it's supposed to, supported by modeling. If we move to something where there's a, a, a neural network in the loop and it the, the, the link back to fundamental physics may well be lost. So that's another consideration on how to, uh, to qualify procedures that do involve machine learning or, uh, it, or a motivation for making the machine learning more uh, reversible back to fundamental physics. Uh, 
So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to give three examples that are pretty much in the order we did them of our first forays into machine learning for NDE. Um, these actually cover what I would describe as the three main um, application, sub-applications within NDE. The first is the measurement of a, uh, a property where it's essentially a regression problem. Uh, in this case, it's to measure the remaining thickness of a structure that may be corroding or eroding, which is pretty much the simplest possible ultrasonic measure, measurement you can make. Um, then one on defect characterization. So having found an indication in a structure from a defect to try and determine what it is in terms of uh, size, type, orientation, and so forth. And uh, I guess these aren't quite in the logical order, but the final one is on the defect detection problem. So basically, is the thing we're uh, testing, does it have any defects that should be classed as critical, which would then lead to the characterization stage? So, um, uh, you, you mentioned in my nice in, uh, introduction that I have a, uh, I'm involved in a spin-out company, so this is, was motivated by the work that they do. So the company makes these uh, little sensors that are permanently stuck on structures that are ultrasonic sensors, and the USP is that they are um, battery-free and completely passive, but the measurement's made by an inductive cu coupling link between the sensor and a device fancifully called a wand, so it's, it's basically a very simple ultrasonic measurement, but you don't need to be uh, skilled to make the measurements the, and the, the sensors permanently coupled, so the measurements are very stable. So the typical sort of applications they're deployed in would be in the petrochemical or chemical process industries where you have some piece of plant or a pipeline that is, is expected to be corroding from the, or eroding from the inside and you want to measure how, how much thickness is left. So very, very simple ultrasonic measurement. It's just uh, send a pulse out, measure how long it takes for it to reflect off the far side of the component and from that work out the thickness. And if you get a nice clean signal like this, obviously this is a completely trivial calculation. You measure the time, this is uh, axis is time between the time you sent the signal and the time the first echo comes back or possibly between the second and third echo. So not exactly rocket science. Um, the, the challenge is um, as a surface corrodes or erodes it will roughen and so although when the when the surf when the components new the signals are very straightforward to interpret uh, as the surface starts to corrode the signals get progressively more and more messy so um what we were looking at was whether there was a simpler way oh sorry there was a, a way that we could just train a, a, a neural network to learn uh, from a range of different surface roughnesses what the underlying roughness was and, and interpret the signals So um, first thing is we need a load of data. And as I said before, getting data with ground truth information um, is not straightforward. So this was done using a 3D FE package called POGO, which was written by a colleague at Imperial College. It's probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest wave propagation uh, codes in the world. We did 20,000 cases of 3D simulations looking at different, different levels of surface roughness, different mean thickness, different dimensions of transducers. I should say this study wasn't originally done with the, the objective of training a neural network. It was actually for more of a parametric study on the optimum parameters for the company's transducers. But as we had the data, we, we wanted to do something else with it. And the machine learning approach, because we didn't um, have any better ideas then, was to go for a, a 1D convolutional neural network. Everything's done in TensorFlow. Uh, and then mess around with the number of layers, the number of filters per layer, and, and very, all the other hyperparameters, um, and see how it went, and compare it to uh, one of the state-of-the-art time series uh, codes, which is uh, inception time. And uh, well, uh, this graph uh, not particularly helpful in its current form, but the the uh, residual, uh, sorry, the RMS error between the measured mean thickness uh, and the true mean thickness is on the y-axis and this is the training time and these are lots of different variants on our simple neural networks and this is the inception time results so if we zoom in on the left hand end these are all the different network architectures we tried and we were um it, you know, some of them they get pretty close to the to the, the, the kind of the state of the art so i was i was quite pleased with this personally because i was one of the things I've, i'm still worried about with the whole um machine learning approaches you have so many hyperparameters and so many architectures to choose from um how do you know when you've got a good one but it, it's kind of convinced me that maybe the actual detail didn't matter there was a certain level of complexity required but once you got beyond that um it would it would be fine it would just be a, a penalty in terms of how long it took to train it 
And the results when we tested this on um, previously unseen data, but still from the model were, um, were pretty encouraging. So this is, these graphs are the uh, true thickness on the bottom axis and the measured thickness on the vertical axis. So this is based on what would be the classical simple interpretation method where you just measure the arrival time of the first peak in the signal. Um, and this is the result of putting them through the train network. And obviously the scatters much less here, which was, which was pleasing. And this is a similar result, but this time training the network to pick out the minimum thickness under its footprint rather than the mean thickness, which is in some ways the more critical parameter in terms of plant integrity. Uh, so this is harder, but um, again, the, the scatters pulled down significantly from a, a simple threshold crossing measure on the, on the, on the original time trace. So, uh, so that was all good. Uh, these kind of summarize the results and the improvement in, uh, in the RMS error uh, as we go to the, the neural network approach. Um, presumably it's pulling out more, well, it obviously it is pulling out more information from the, the A scan is the ultrasonic ND community's word for a time domain signal, I'm not quite sure why, but it's pulling out more information rather than just looking at one value can't reverse engineer it so easily in terms of say, well, what exactly is it pulling out? But it's certainly doing something that improves the result. Um, then we made the mistake of trying to do it on some experimental data. Um, so this was acquired under rather different circumstances. And this uh, this is, I think, a major reason for the problems, but um, you know, it, it kind of looks roughly similar. There's more noise in the experimental data. And I think another problem is that the simulated data because of the way we did the modeling has some extra features in it, which are not necessarily present physically. You can see there's a sort of a, an extra wibble in the blue line here before the first arrival, which might be providing the uh, neural network with something extra to leverage, which isn't there in reality. Uh, anyway, the net result of doing this was that the result is absolutely rubbish. Um, the, the, the RMS error now is uh, 3.7 millimeters. When, when we're talking about structures that are only about 10 millimeters thick anyway, it's basically a completely useless um, measurement. So that wasn't particularly good. Um, uh, so the obvious conclusion, it, it, the network was working fine, but it was working off something that wasn't there in the physical data. Um, so the long-term solution, which um, if we ever get back into the lab uh, and have time to do some better modeling is to do a better simulation that's more accurately captures what we had experimentally. But as just as a curiosity, we tried adding some noise to the training data and from the FE model and then retraining. And it turned out that by adding absolutely tons of random noise to the FE simulated data and then applying the network trained on the noisy data, we could actually eventually recover um, a, a result that was fractionally better um, uh, than, than, than we had otherwise. Uh, sorry, just using classical interpretation. So it's not an ideal result, but it, I guess adding the noise desensitizes um, the network to small features that not necessarily there in in the real data. Uh, so this, I don't want to labour this particularly. I mean, this was our first foray into machine learning, so it's probably quite naive. Um, so the conclusions, the, I, one of the key things was basically the amount of data you need, and it seems to me that about um, minimum uh, ten thousand data sets is where you start to be able to do something that you couldn't do um, by physics based. Uh, reasoning alone, uh, it, it, the, the machine learning actually adds some value. Um, the network needs to be complex enough to describe the problem, but um, provided you try a few different architectures and they're all converging uh, to roughly the same ultimate level of error, uh, it kind of shows that you've got there. Uh, so that kind of slightly allayed my concerns about the number of hyperparameters. And uh, this, uh, as it's supposed to be a physics informed um, seminar, uh, there's pretty minimal physics aspects in this, other than I guess the fact that the network is trained entirely on a physics-based model. So although we don't know exactly what the network's doing, the physics of the inspection is somehow encoded within it because it's everything it's learned is from a model that's based on known physics. There's also the fact that we we're using a CNN rather than a, a fully connected network. So we are making some, uh, exploiting some knowledge that the, the, the signals we're processing are time signals and there is some, um, relative importance of adjacent values to each other rather than just being a collection of a thousand um, data values or how many points there are in a signal. So the next example um, is something that looks a bit more, uh, more promising. This was done by my NGD student, Richard Pyle, um, who's working for Baker Hughes, who are a big uh, sort of oil and gas uh, service provider. And 
amongst other products, they make and deploy these things called PIGs, which are allegedly is, is an acronym for pipeline inspection gauge, but they're basically fantastically expensive pieces of equipment um, that are put into long pipelines, several hundred kilometers long potentially, and run through them, uh, pushed by the flow of product and inspect as they go, making measurements at incredibly high density, like every few millimeters, um, both circumferentially and axially along the pipe. So they run through the pipe for a day or so, and then they're plucked out somewhere, their hard drives are taken out and the data is examined. So there's a huge amount of data um, to deal with. And the, the, the interest in this work was really, can we automate the data analysis and um, make it easier to classify what defects are detected? So not the detection problem, but once the, a defect is detected in the ultrasonic data, can we help to uh, determine what it is? There's an end on view. This, the pipes are roughly a meter diameter, that kind of order. And the, around the perimeter of the pipe, the thing that's actually doing the measuring are a series of ultrasonic arrays. So each one has um, a 40 uh, individually addressable elements in it. They are fired in a certain firing sequence, but the net result is that waves are sent in. Uh, so the pipe will be full of oil. They pass through the oil. This is the wall of the pipe. They refract slightly. So they in the pipe they're traveling at about 45 degrees they reflect off the back surface and then the array is listening for what comes back with each of the 40 elements individually so from each measurement we get 40 separate time traces which i think i uh, drew on them yes that, so for each individual array and there's about 20 of these around the circumference and they're going to be doing this uh, operation every 10 millimeters or so along a, several hundred kilometers of pipe there are 40 of these time domain signals coming out um, that's the absolute raw data. So the, the physics-based pre-processing is to convert that into um, an ultrasonic image of a, a region in the pipe wall. And there are two ways, well, there are lots of ways we can do it, but the two ways we've we, we chosen to do it based on uh, prior knowledge of what works best is to exploit two different um, ultrasonic mode conversions. So S's stand for shear waves, which are what go in. They come to a point in the image, and then we consider whether the scattered energy, if there is a defect there, comes back either as a shear wave or as a longitudinal wave, which the two um, ultrasonic wave modes in an elastic material, they'll follow slightly different paths and the velocities are different. So we basically, we have the option of generating from each array position, two images, one associated with this ray path combination and one associated with this ray path combination. And furthermore, just to go back a bit, we also see the same region from the array a bit further around the circumference. So we look at it from the other side. So in total, for every region on the pipe wall, we end up with four um, related images. So the information scattered across four images, which is why it's a hard task for an operator to, to process this information. So we do the obvious thing, which is to um, train a, uh, it is a convolutional neural network, but we, we train a, a machine learning algorithm to try and um, infer what the properties of a defect present in the system are. So the defects we're looking at are cracks indicated by these black lines coming in from the back wall, uh, varying lengths and varying angles relative to the straight through direction. So in total, uh, about 25,000 uh, data sets we use for training. And this, we have a much better model here of what's going on, one that's much more close to the experimental reality. And in fact, it uses a, a technique which I think has great promise, which is to superpose simulated responses from the defect onto experimentally measured responses from defect free structure so which are readily available so we get data that looks very convincingly like uh, the experiment you can sort of see the, the challenge of interpretation here is that there's some the red blob here is the one that's from the defect in this image but there's also this ghost one up here which is an artifact of a, a different mode so anyway the the, uh, well, there's, there's the architecture of the network. It's a, it's a 2D convolutional neural network, but with a sort of four layer um, image going in, which represents the four different um, views of the region of interest. So it's kind of like, uh, same as processing the channels from an RGB image, except there's now four of them rather than three. And there's one, there's actually two networks. There's one that predicts length and one that predicts angle, but the, the length, what the actual critical parameter is the through thickness, uh, length so length times the cos of the angle that uh, we, we actually train two networks to get them both independently uh, i won't go through this just basically looking at the hyperparameters and seeing how complex the network had to be to to get a result that would seem to have converged to what best it was going to be 
oh sorry yes there is a point here so we the, the way it was done was the network the network is trained on the simulated data but at, uh, at each training epoch it's then tested on some actual experimental data uh, that's not been seen before from genuine cracks which were machined into a few test coupons so it's the the the, the training uh, and iterative training test makes use of a combination of simulated and a limited amount of experimental data and the, the, the point at which the experimental data um, error reaches a minimum is taken as being the optimum network. So this is actually an ongoing topic of research is how best to make use of a limited amount of experimental data but a large amount of simulated data. And the results, uh, well, again, we saw a significant improvement in the sizing accuracy. So this is the length error. This is the angle error uh, compared to the, the blue bars in the background of what we'd get if we just did a conventional sizing technique based on one of the images, the most promising image, but in isolation, which is essentially what a, a human operator would be doing. Um, and well, yes, you can see that the, the RMS errors dropped quite significantly by about a factor of three. So that, that, that was all encouraging. Um, the 6 dB drop method is the, the sort of standard one that an operator would use. Uh, Richard also looked at the effect of uncertainties in the parameters. So we can, because we're simulating data, we can do things like tweaking the, the velocities used, um, both uh, in uh, the ultrasonic velocities used to simulate the, uh, what would happen if some of the physical quantities were not known precisely, which is almost invariably the case. And the, the finding from this, which I think is, uh, yeah, sorry, just let me look at which side I'm on. Yes, uh, basically, if, if you train on data with um, uncertainty in the physical parameters, you are then more robust to making measurements on data with, which also has uncertainty, which I don't think is a particularly surprising conclusion, but um, it, it, was, it was good to see it, um, it came out. Um, once again, key finding, well, not finding, an observation was that having it basically, it was again a, more than 10,000, in this case, 25,000 training data sets were, were required to get some something actually useful. Physics informed aspects here are that the, uh, well, again, the model is physics based, but also that we do a pre-processing step. So we're not just feeding raw data into the network. We've already done one step, which is to convert that into images. So we're exp effectively, exploiting our prior knowledge of wave physics and diffraction and constructive and destructive interference to do something. Maybe we're throwing away a bit of data at that stage because that's uh, uh, we're making some prior uh, judgments on what, what we think is going to be useful, but that um, it, it makes it a more tractable challenge. It also means that the, it's slightly easier to relate it back to, to something that's interpretable. What am I doing for time? Right, the final example uh, so this is a detection example, um, is a guided wave monitoring. Uh, this was primarily done by a guy, Kang Wei Wang, who is a visitor from Harbin, who's just gone back to China. And the, 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 challenge, is, the challenge here is a slightly different ultrasonic one. So this is actually a, a, a now derelict water tank outside the back of the mechanical engineering department in Bristol, but it's one that we've had a a number of sensors stuck on for um, uh, nine years now, connected up to some automatic recording equipment. And these sensors are low frequency ultras ultrasonic ones. So um, they operate at 200 kilohertz, which in ultrasonic terms is, is low. Uh, the previous imaging would have been done at five megahertz. So at this frequency, the sound doesn't go straight down through the structure directly underneath the sensor, it radiates out in all directions. So we're into a regime where the waves that are propagating are guided waves, they propagate throughout this plate-like structure and they bounce around, they reflect off the edges. And if there's the uh, hope is that if there's uh, damage occurs in the structure, whether it's a, a localized corrosion patch or if it was a composite structure, it might be impact damage that there'll be a reflection of the waves from the, the damage that we picked up either by the same sensor or by another one in the network. So this is, um, yeah, this idea of using guided waves is one of the, the ways of getting complete structural coverage from a, a small, a sparse array of, of permanently installed sensors. What, on the thickness gauging application that I talked about first, each sensor is only making a point measurement. So you can't say anything about 
um, defects that are remote from the sensor location. You just have to infer based on the statistics what you measure, what's going on everywhere else. So that's fine in some cases if you're anticipating uniform corrosion, but if you're looking for localized defects, then you basically have to have something that can actually interrogate the whole structure. Anyway, the problem with guided wave sensors is that you send out a pulse of energy from say this one, you receive it on this one, and even in the absence of any defects in the structure, the signal you get back will be horrendously complicated because you'll see the reflections from every feature in the structure, the edges, the corners, um, reverberations within the flanges, et cetera. So the, the basic signal you get is in the first place is already horrendously complicated. And what you're actually looking for is a subtle change on top of that due to a new signal occurring due to some localized damage. So. In an ideal world, you could make one measurement, um, come back a year later, make another measurement, subtract one from the other, and they subtract perfectly, except in the region where any new signals had appeared. The reality is that um, just about everything affects the propagation of guided waves. Temperature is by far the biggest effect. Um, uh, so the, the wave velocity changes slightly with temperature, and of course the, wave, the temperature might not be uniform over the plate. So you get slight shifts in the signal, and because you're doing a a subtraction of RF signals, they basically mean it's very, very hard to do a perfect subtraction. So this has been an ongoing challenge for, uh, I guess, several decades now as to how to reliably detect changes in guided wave signals. Um, so we've got here we've got data going back where it started collecting in 2012. There are 20 um, sets of data recorded in 2012. There were lots more sets of data, but we took 20 of them roughly evenly distributed throughout the year. Um, as our baseline data set. So these are the ones that we assume were, at this point, the structure is intact, or at least it's intact relative to what it's, what's going to happen to it in future years. So we assume that the 2012 data is from good structure. And then the objective is to, given a later measurement in 2013 onwards, in fact, we go right up to 2020, can we make use of that data from 2012 and try and work out if anything's changed um, since then? So the, the two methods here, uh, the, the machine learning one is the one on the right, so I'm in, I'll explain that in a minute, but the thing we're up against is the sort of the classical method of doing it, which is to take your 20 odd um, uh, signals that were retained when the structure was notionally undamaged. Um, when you make a new measurement, you look back through your database and you pick the one that best matches it because the signals you've acquired uh, in the training period will hopefully span a range of environmental conditions. You might do a few other twiddles to that signal, like stretching it, scaling the amplitude, possibly translate it backwards and forwards, which, which gives you a bit of fine tuning. But ultimately you play around with it and then you subtract it from the current signal and what's left over is a residual signal. And it's in that residual signal that you try and determine if there's been a change over some given detection threshold, which will be what, what enables you to detect damage in the structure. So the method we, or I should say Kangway proposed here was a, a nonlinear autoregressive exogenous network or NARCs for short, where you start with the same training data and you train the network. And I'll explain a bit more of what that means in a second. Um, and basically the information associated with all the, the, the training data is somehow encapsulated in the network. Then when you receive a, a subsequent signal, you pass it through the trained network that will make a prediction of what it thinks the signal would look like if there weren't any defects there, because that's the information it's been trained on. You then subtract that prediction from your measurement. If there have, aren't any defects, then there shouldn't be anything left. And if there are, there will be a residual signal. So the final output is still a residual signal, much as in the classical method. It's just that the means of generating the signal you subtract is different. And the mechanics of how the NARCS method work, uh, my limited understanding at least, is that um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, it, well, it's a time series prediction uh, or a regression. It takes a window of data in a time domain signal um, and it, it, the NARCS network learns to predict what the next point in the time series was, or it can be multiple points ahead, but here we're just going one point ahead. So the sort of thing that might be used for financial forecasting. So it's trained on defect free signals. So what it tries to do is to learn what the next point would be based on the previous points in the defect free case. If it then encounters um, a departure in the measured signal from what it's previously been trained on, it will predict what it thinks the defect free one should look like, but that will depart from the measurement. And so if, when you subtract the two, you'll hopefully be left with the, um, the signal arising from a defect. 
And so there is a bit of um, physics that's been exploited here, which is causality, which is that um, <coughs> the signal from a defect can't start before a certain time because it will take a certain amount of time for waves to get there from the transmitting transducer and back to the receiving transducer. So the, 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 the physics that's been exploited is, is exactly that, that if you only make the prediction based on the previous measurements, you can't anticipate the arrival of a new defect signal occurring later in time. And I, although that's very simple, I think it's got some quite profound implications for NDE. Anyway, uh, oh, sorry, there's a point there. Um, well, one good thing is that it, the machine learning can be trained entirely on measured defect-free data because you don't need the, uh, any data containing defects for the training purposes. Um, you do require uh, synthetic data from defects if you want to quantify the performance later, as I'll explain in a moment. And uh, the, the typical results that come out are, uh, right, let's get this right. Um, so top row is from the classical method, uh, the bottom row is from the new method. And these are, <coughs> in the left-hand column, these are defect-free signals recorded from the following year. So 2012 was when we trained it, 2013 is when we tested it. This is just one example signal. And in fact, what's shown here is the residual. So after applying either the OBS method or the NARCS method, and uh, okay, well, that's the defect-free case. And then we add in a simulated defect signal um, at a particular instant in time. This is for testing purposes. And uh, run the same signal through both methods. And in the OBS method, well, the defect signal is basically no bigger than the, the, the error from the residual anyway, just on, on, on normal data. So we can't say anything, we can't really detect anything. But in the NARC case, the same size defect actually does yield something that's significantly above the background noise level. So we quantify this. This is a detection problem, a sort of thing that's done all the time in medical diagnosis. Um, by plotting the probability of false alarm versus the probability of detection and going to do a lot of examples to get the statistics. And what we're looking for is I, the ideal point is one up at the top left where you have 100% uh, guarantee of detection and no false alarms. The reality is you follow, as you change your detection threshold, you follow some trajectory and it depends on the application exactly which point you choose on it. But generally you want to be as close to this corner as possible. So we did that as an objective measure of uh, performance comparison and these graphs have kind of summarized the results. Uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, we, sorry, I should have said the, the, the metric we're using to condense the, the ROC curve down to one number is to look at the area underneath it. So a perfect detector, if you can get up to this corner, uh, we'll have a area under curve of one, a random guessing one um, is roughly a diagonal line. So it has an area of a half. So the closer you get to one, the better. And this is looking at the performance for a number of different sizes of defect signal uh, for the OBS method and the NARCs. And you can see that for um, the three biggest defects, the NARCs perform almost has perfect detection capability. It's only the smallest one where it, it starts to fall off. Whereas the OBS one, even with the largest defects detected, it's still uh, only it, well, 0.8 error in the curve is not a particularly great detector. It'd be absolutely hopeless for any NDE applications. Uh, so this is pretty encouraging. At this point, we didn't entirely know how it was working. And in fact, I still don't entirely know how it works. I have a sort of vague understanding. Um, but we also looked at the <coughs> uh, going forwards in time. So not just 2013, but right up to 2020. So still using the same net, the networks trained on 2012 data. We've got multiple sensors on here. So we don't have to just look at one pair in isolation. If we look at multiple pairs, we can form some sort of image of the location of uh, potential defects. This, this is kind of like the next level on while, beyond just detecting them, where are they? Um, and these results show the images of applying the network trained on 2012 data to data obtained each subsequent year up to, well, so some subsequent years up to 2020. Um, this tank's just sat outside and it's corroding and it's basically falling apart. It's not in use anymore. So we would expect to see some um, progressive degradation and that does indeed seem to be the case. Uh, obviously you could say, well, that's just because the sensors are all drifting and it's not actually there's any damage in the tank. So we did a final test, um, which is to physically stick uh, a, uh, a little point mass, which was a steel cylinder onto a point on the surface, which will act as a scatterer of guided waves and see if we could detect that localized change. And uh, well, the basic answer is yes, yes, we could, which I thought was um, 
uh, really quite amazing, given that this was all done on data that had been uh, trained eight years previously, the signals, the sensors have degraded since then, the structures generally degraded, but we're still able to pick up um, a localized change from something that's really quite small in terms of the size of the overall structure. Uh, so the, the well the conclusions that this is this is this is a nice technique and that doesn't require any signals from defects for the training uh, so it's particularly good uh, on things like structural health monitoring where you can acquire data uh, very easily um, repeatedly on a, on a on a structure when it's first installed the, the causality uh, being exploited in the way the data is processed i think is quite important because we're not training a neural network to recognize defects. We're training a neural network, a NARCS network in this case, to predict what the defect free signal should be, which means that the detection step is subtracting a current measurement from a predicted defect free signal, which means that um, the, the, the signals we'd expect from any defects can be predicted very readily from our, our understanding of classical wave mechanics. So it kind of, um, partially takes out the black box nature of the um, of, of a machine learning approach because the final detection is still done on something that can be predicted from classical uh, wave scattering theory. So this is why I'm, I think this is quite an interesting technique in terms of um, potentially, maybe not in this form, but this, this concept as a, as a way of getting machine learning accepted into NDE for safety critical applications, because it makes it slightly easier or quite maybe quite a lot easier to interpret what's actually going on in terms of detection and characterization at the, at the final step. So some overall conclusions. Uh, well, I, I think machine learning capabilities do offer major potential for NDE. Um, there's no shortage of off the shelf techniques. We've been using mainly TensorFlow and a bit of MATLAB. Um, it's fair to say that machine learning capability is far in advance of NDE requirements, but there are uh, understanding how best to use it for NDEs is, is, is I think, uh, well, is, is a major topic of research, both for my group and many others around the world. Uh, and the, the, the critical enabling technology, which is basically why NDE hasn't been so quick on the bandwagon uh, of machine learning is that the amount of data you need, if you're doing it synthetically, just the tools to generate it haven't been available until relatively recently. So the challenge is, um, well, generating the data is one thing, but um, kind of that all needs to be automated because if you're generating tens of thousands, and that's probably the, the, the starting point, maybe hundreds of thousands is what we need. We need the whole simulation tool chain to be automated. Uh, so this idea of combining experimental measurements with simulated defect data seems to be quite a powerful one, but there's, there's, there's some questions about how, that, how much that can generalize. Um, and a, a crucial requirement is, can you prove that the synthetic data is good enough? Um, because machine learning by its nature will exploit details that are, are not necessarily ones that can be visually seen or easily visually seen, how do you know it's not pulling out something that's an artifact of your, uh, your simulation, which is kind of what we saw in the first example. So this is a open challenge is how to pr prove that your synthetic data is good enough. And um, as I said before, having a robust method for designing, training and using machine learning is, is essential if it's going to be taken up. And something we're working on at the moment is dealing with a situation that's fairly common where you have a, let's say, almost unlimited amount of simulated data, but a very small amount of experimental data containing actual known ground truth defects. How do you make best use of that? Uh, so we're looking at various domain and adaptation techniques to learn mainly on the simulated data, but just be fine tuned by the experimental data, uh, but without throwing away the original um, data. So that's an interesting topic. Uh, and also quantifying the uncertainty of what comes out of a neural network. And very last point, I've just started a new interest group, Data Science for Engineering Structural Integrity. If you're interested in this topic, it's a bit wider than NDE. Well, it is a lot wider than NDE. It's, um, it's how NDE structural integrity and material characterization fit together and can exploit data science. There's a launch event Friday week. Uh, if you want to come, just drop me an email and I'll send you a link. Right, uh, that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. So um, if anybody would like to ask questions oh yeah we can we can also use the clap function <laughs> uh if anybody would like to ask questions you may do so using the uh raise hand uh function in the chat i believe so let's see 
or you may also opt to type in the question into the chat. So, oh, there's a question from Grim. Go ahead, Grim. Hello. Yeah. Hi. So, I'm, I'm, I'm Graham West from uh, Strathclyde University. Um, thank you for our talk, very, very interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you had some thoughts of sort of uh, getting out your crystal ball and looking at um, uh, rolling through to industrial deployment of some of these techniques and, and, and specifically uh, acceptance of these techniques. Would you see these sort of machine learning techniques being qualified sort of um, along the lines of the traditional sort of mat, uh, um, existing processes where you would effectively give a, uh, the machine learning system a, a, a bunch of tests, a bunch of a qualification exam, if you like? Or do you think the industry is maybe more aligned to uh, a more software-based approach where it would be, you know, sort of, I guess, traditional um, uh, full sort of breakdown and V and V of the, of, of the software code? I don't know, do you have any, any uh, sense of uh, that? I, well, f f from the NDE regulators' perspective, mm -hmm. I would say that they are completely not set up to do anything <laughs> involving uh, well, but sca probably scarcely even software. They'll expect a sort of QA process to be in place for anything involving software, but dealing with something that's not uh, just implementing sort of standard physics-based approaches, I think none of their, their procedures are uh, adequately set up for it. And in fact, many of the the sort of standard approaches for quantifying the performance of inspections, I don't think work in their current format for, for the output of machine learning algorithms. So I think there needs to be a kind of, if these things are going to become widely used and accepted, there needs to be a, com a complete rethink on how you go about qualifying uh, an inspection, which I, I think will probably be what's, I think what you alluded to, which is basically just um, feeding it very high fidelity uh, Simula uh, simulated data, but one that's data that's indistinguishable from real data that spans a huge parameter space and proving statistically that you can detect everything you say you can. At the moment, qualifications are based on a, a large body of physical reasoning supported by maybe 30 odd tests on experimental coupons, which of course nowhere near explores any sort of meaningful parameter space, but they kind of confirm that uh, you understand what you're talking about, but that, I, I just don't think that's adequate. No. What about that? Or, or would you see that? I, I guess on a related question is, um, is there an appetite within the industry to go towards that direction? How far advanced do you think um, the sort of the, the NDE community are um, in terms of progress along along that path? And I guess, is there, a, is there a middle ground where you've got a sort of a you know, human machine sort of hybrid as a stepping stone? Yeah, to yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Um, so I mean, one of the obvious things you can do, given that 99% of real data is defect free, is just a tool to sift that and let the operator focus on the last couple of percent. Um, it, it would be a useful starting point. I think in terms of industrial appetite, it's very dependent on the industry. So for example, the nuclear industry is almost completely driven by their regulators. On the other hand, for a, a manufacturing companies like say, uh, Rolls-Royce it's more about is there a, um, a, a business benefit as much as um, the, the, the safety benefits have got to be uh, has to be satisfied but what is there a, a commercial motivation for doing it and I think that they companies like that are very keen um, they can they can see the potential mo removing human error re reducing um, the number of operators you have to pay um, and they when I've spoken to them they don't seem to see um, what I would say is maybe some of the obvious um, obstacles as being obstacles. They say, well, you know, machine learning, it will just be another tool. We'll have a procedure for how it's deployed. We'll have a, a quality control method, which algorithm using what it's been trained on. It will, it will fit into our existing um, protocols for deploying any new manufacturing technique, which is encouraging. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Do we have any um, further questions? If so, I can maybe ask, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, so with regards to the challenge of, of, you know, requirement of training data that you say is, is, is needed for such networks, um, do you think that maybe exploring different better ways of integrating the physics-based physics physics models with uh, machine learning 
can perhaps tackle that that uh, um, you know data necessity. Perhaps you know involving better working on better physics representations that would reduce the need to learn from scratch. Yes, possibly, but I don't know anything about how you actually do that. I <laughs> welcome any advice from from this group on how to do it. I mean, the, the in terms of simulating data, um, just just raw data, that's all done with physics-based models. I mean, generally FE or some uh, some other direct numerical method. So they they capture all the known physics because basically, if we couldn't do that, we wouldn't know how the techniques worked and we wouldn't be using them. So. There's not a fundamental problem in solving the forward problem other than the computational cost. But then in terms of reducing or uh, helping with the inverse problem, which is what we're using machine learning for, that's the bit I don't really know how best you could uh, integrate the physics into that beyond doing sort of basic pre-processing the data to turn raw ultrasonic time domain signals into images, which is kind of what I showed, but I'm not sure you could do more than that. All right, that could be an open question right there. Yep, yep. Any, if anyone's got any ideas, do get in touch. Yeah, fantastic. Um, any other questions? All right. If I may uh, ask maybe yes. just one last question. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Paul, for, for the interesting talk. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I was wondering, if I understood correctly, like this analysis focus on, uh, on time series analysis. So I was wondering whether it would make sense to use uh, machine learning to derive some, some effective physical laws using measurements from, from different quantities like temperature or the material use, or as, as you said, the wave scattering. Uh, because machine learning is true that it can uh, highlight some non-physical behavior, but also can bring to the surface some physics that we've not considered maybe. Yeah, I, I certainly think in the in the wider context of linking multiple modalities of NDE measurements, possibly with other other sensing like temperature, pressure off a plant, there's a there's a there's definitely a real potential for machine learning to reveal some underlying physics or mostly new physics, but new interactions that were previously unknown, which might be of great benefit to to plant mm -hmm. operators. I'm not. I'd say I'm less less convinced that you're going to. Uh, expose any unknown say, ultrasonic physics or, or indeed in any of the domains because I think that's it's pretty well um, understood I mean it hasn't <laughs> when I gave my uh, inaugural lecture about 15 years ago somebody said uh, sound wasn't that all done like 100 years ago and I said, yeah actually that's a fair point isn't it <laughs> it's <laughs> it, it's it, it, I, I just said I oh, well actually I work on the inverse problems so that's harder okay no, thank you because I think there is a similar approach that was used by uh, a Turing fellow on, uh, on medical applications. Like the parameters were different. Uh, for instance, the age of the patient to the level of sugar in the blood and uh, this Turing fellow set up a, a machine learning uh, environment that allowed to filter out for each, for each individual the important parameters for, for a given therapy. So I was wondering whether uh, something similar could, could make sense with uh, uh, your the applications that you presented so that was like where yeah. i was coming from oh yeah yeah I, and actually i was just thinking again there's sort of more new manufacturing processes like the many variants of additive manufacturing um they're not they're not fully understood in terms of how all the um the parameters interact with each other in terms of the build parameters and the speeds and the temperatures and the powers involved so um linking back uh to the to the the NDE measurements on the completed part or even the part while it's being made to the process parameters, I think um, is is another valuable area of research to, to what, which really would add value to manufacturing companies. All right, um, thank you so much, and I I think it's best to maybe um, wrap it up here. I know that you have another commitment. Uh, yeah, so, just, uh, students just seems to just appeared on Teams for me. So uh, yeah, I'm right. to go. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thanks once again, Paul. Thanks for your time and for your fantastic. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks for sharing um, sharing your work with us. And uh, to everyone else, we we um, hope to um, welcome you again for our next seminar, to which we will be um, sending out the the calendar invitation and information shortly. So thanks once again, and uh, have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, Paul.